Somebody put me on to something today that just absolutely blessed my heart. I want to move that up just a bit there. And um, I would have never expected it from this guy. I used to watch wrestling when I was a little boy. In St. Louis, they had wrestling at the chase at the Chase Park Plaza Hotel, and they used to televise it. And I used to think that was the neatest thing in the world. Guys like uh, Dick the Bruiser and Andre the Giant and Harley Race and those guys, okay? Then it got big with the WWF. Somebody wanted to know what war that was. There was WW2 and WWF. But anyway, um, a guy named Hulk Hogan came on the scene. Now, I since learned it's fake as a $3 bill. But Hogan said this, and I'm just going, not bad. He said, think about it. And he quoted the verse of scripture. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I forgive their sin and um, heal their land. I'm, I'm missing something out of that. Then will I, something, forgive their sin and heal their land. Anyway, he quoted that verse and he said, think about it. Just like with Egypt, when God sent the plagues in, we find out that those plagues were actually the gods that the Egyptians worshipped. The flies and the frogs and different things like that. And he said, Think about it. What has what God taken away from this nation? Our gods. And our gods in this nation are Hollywood, films, and actors, sports teams and their players, uh, rock and roll and country music mus musicians, and their top of the chart billionaire, millionaire singers, and the record companies. And, what's be, and the public school system, it's another one. What's been affected? God has taken away all of the people can't go to theaters now. People can't go to ball games now. People, kids can't go to public school now. And I'm going, not bad from a guy who makes his money faking fights. Not bad. So uh, every now and then out of the mouths of babes comes something good. And I, th I think there's something to that. I really do. Uh, we've got uh, some people to pray for. I'm going to mention some names now. Uh, I talked to Brother Roy uh, last night. He was really, really uh, upset um, because uh, Sister Bonnie, of course, is in a skilled care facility. And they have, naturally, they have that quarantined off. Well, which means that they won't let him in to come and see her. And it's really bothering him. So he was making phone calls to her. Well, she got another infection. And he called over there yesterday and said, I want to talk to my wife. And they said, we can't let her come to the phone. We have her quarantined off from everybody else, we can't, we can't bring her to the phone. He was not very happy about that. John, you talked to him, I talked to him, tried to soothe him down a little bit. Um, you know, it's one thing to understand why, but then your emotions kick in. And I told him, I said, Roy, I understand it. That's your wife. I would feel the same way. So pray for Roy, pray for Bonnie, that she gets over this quickly and uh, is able to at least talk to Roy again on the phone. And uh, so pray for them, pray for all of our widows. I've, I've talked to a few of them and just lift them up. So far as I know, everybody's doing fine. They've all quarantined themselves. And I mentioned this yesterday during Pastor Michael Online. It occurred to me, this is actually biblical what's being done because God had a remedy for the children of Israel and them congregating and he said if you suspect somebody has a contagious disease specifically leprosy 
If you even suspect they have it, quarantine them off. You don't want to take a chance in everybody else getting infected because leprosy will have, it'll take years to kill you, but it'll kill you. Okay? And it's not something you want. Neither is this virus. And I mean, I don't, she's already announced it, but it was my daughter that was this part of this church that had that virus. And we've kind of gone over with her the symptoms that she had, and she had it. We're just reasonably sure of it. And she says, you don't want it. There's no way in the world you want it. So it's not just, on, and, and it affects everybody differently, and we understand that. Uh, but um, I'd, it's certainly not anything that I would want anybody else in this church to have, especially me. I don't want it. Um, and I, and I, you know, I've done this before. If I show up here because I have to preach and I've got a cold or I've got the flu or I've got something going on with me, I don't shake anybody's hands. I, I stay away from everybody and I do that because I love them. And it's actually biblical. If you go and examine, what was it, Leviticus 13 and 14, I think, God had rules that apply in this situation. Yes, we have rights in this country. Okay? Let me tell you what meekness is. Meekness is not weakness. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Abraham showed meekness when the herdsmen of Abraham and Lot strove together. Abraham could have said, it's my field. It's my field, my wells, my water. Okay, but that's not what he did. He displayed meekness to his nephew Lot, who he had basically adopted, and he said, you take your pick. Instead of us fighting, you take your pick, whichever one you want, Whatever direction you go, I'll go the other way. And we all know the outcome of that. Lot chose the well-watered plains of Sodom. Then God took Abraham, this is Genesis 13, and he said to him, Abraham, look northward, southward, eastward, westward. All that thy eyes behold will I give unto thee. And those are in continuous lines, the earth, all four directions. The meek shall inherit the earth. Moses displayed meekness when his own brother and sister strove against him and said, what, you think God only talks to you? And God let them know right then and there. If I'm going to speak to a prophet, I'll do it by dream or a vision. But Moses is different. I speak to him face to face, God said. So Moses displayed meekness. He, had a, he was in authority. He had the right to use that authority, but he yielded to God. And so we have the rights to assemble. There's no doubt about that. But there are occasions when it is wise and it displays meekness to yield those rights, not give up those rights, but to temporarily yield those rights over for the benefit of other people. God will reward you for that. And I believe he does. And in talking to the various people, yeah, we all want to get back in church and get life back to normal again. But look at what has happened in our nation. The bars are not full right now. Um, the stadiums, which are bars, are not full right now. And people are having to spend their nights at home with their children. Imagine that. Amen? Amen. So um, we are going to continue uh, doing the services this way until we feel that the, um, the danger is sufficiently, I'm not going to wait for it totally to go away, but until we feel that the danger is sufficiently diminished to where we don't put people in danger. And even at that, I've already talked to some people and probably by choice. They will choose to stay home and watch the service for a while until they feel safe enough to come back. So that's our plan and that's uh, I think what we're going to do uh, at least for the next few weeks and we'll just pray and see how it works. But we've got to pray for our 
our people, pray for all the people in our church, pray that they're safe, pray for all the people that watch us online, pray that they stay safe, that nobody gets the virus, and if they do, that God sustains them. Hey, I'm praying for Boris Johnson, Prime Minister of, of England, who is in the ICU uh, in, I don't know what kind of condition he's in, but intensive care unit in a British hospital. And from what I can see, he's a good guy. He's the one saying to England, let's pull out of the European Union. Hoorah for England. And, uh, and I'm in favor of that. And I'm in favor of us like getting out of the United Nations too. So, uh, but anyway, pray for him. Um, John Damano, big Italian John and Bunny, our good friends. He has a friend of his, I think, whose wife, uh, I'm going to try to remember this right, her name is Lance, and I think she has cancer is what he said, and he wants us to pray for her, so we're going to lift her up too as well, and um, you pray for people that you know and needs that you know, God will hear the prayer, God will bless, and we'll just trust in the Lord. Let's take our Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, let's start there tonight. And um, we're looking and examining the issue of the Bible. And the question that I'm asking tonight is, is the Bible still the inspired Word of God? Is it still right? Now, I've been, you know, I don't hang around liberals. I don't go to liberal churches. If I go to preaching conferences, Usually, it's a bunch of fundamentalist preachers. But I've learned, and this, this bothered me when I, when I first learned this. Um, we went to a preaching conference in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And I heard that it was going to be all just good guys preaching the old-time way. So we get out there. The first sermon is by one of the men of the committee who ran this particular preacher's conference. And he spent 30 minutes bashing the King James Bible and people who believe the King James Bible. And he's supposed to be a conservative. And I was, my wife will tell you, she remembers it, I was furious. And I kept saying, I'm going back. We were already in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. We drove out there and I'm going, I'm driving back home. And David Gibbs of the Christian Law Association was supposed to speak after this guy. And David Gibbs is a staunch King James guy. And David Gibbs says, if I go into a courtroom representing a church, he represents churches in lawsuits. And he says, if I go into a courtroom representing a church and it's over a doctrinal issue, he said, I'm taking a King James in with me. Because King James has the right legal language of what we believe and why we believe it. And I agree with that. And so had it not been for David Gibbs preaching right after him, and David Gibbs preached a powerful message on reading the Bible. And he said he met a guy just in line at a gas station or something like that and got to talk to him about the Bible. And the guy said, yeah, I read the Bible quite a bit. And David gives at, he said, well, I read the Bible. I read the Bible through in a year. And this guy said, yeah. He said, I read the Bible through every month. Every month? He said, yeah, you can do it. And he said, I've got it all worked out how I read the Bible. But he said, it's like two or three times a day. He'll sit down, take time out, and read the Bible. But he said, I read the Bible through in a month. And I'm just going... Wow. But anyway, had it not been for that, I would have left. But I found out that just because they are conservative and all the men cut their hair short, and all the ladies, ladies wear long dresses and have long hair, that doesn't necessarily mean that they believe the Bible is still inspired. And my very first pastor in this church, a name I will not speak, I don't know if he's still alive. I was stunned when I found out what he believed about the King James. He ridiculed people who believed the King, and he did it to me not knowing what I stood for. He ridiculed those who believe only the King James and believe it's perfect. He was a Greek professor at a Bible college. 
So he knew more than everybody else. And I was going to have him preach at this church. And I went, get that. So the question is, is the Bible still, is it still inspired? 2 Timothy 3, 15. Paul said that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. But you look at what he said. At from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is present tense word given by inspiration of God and is right now profitable for doctrine, is profitable for reproof, is profitable for correction, and is profitable for instruction in righteousness. Now, I'm not adding to the word of God. I'm explaining how that sentence works. Is right now profitable for all these, doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Four things. Imagine that. That the man of God may be perfect. So the question is, can we be perfect from an imperfect source? Can, does imperfection breed perfection? Does corrupt seed produce incorrupt fruit? Does corrupt, incorrupt seed produce corrupt fruit? Both of the answers to that is no. Jesus told us that himself. The man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. Let's go to the Lord. We'll pray for these that we've mentioned, and uh, you pray. Father in heaven, we come before you. This evening, we thank you, God, for the health that we have. We thank you, God, for the healing that you have given to those who have been sick. And, Father, we pray for those right now, Lord, who have this virus. It is a terrible, awful thing, and some are dying. And Father, we pray, dear God, for those that are sick. We pray, dear God, that you would remove this. But, Father, we see a wisdom in this. We see how that... People are turning back to you in some cases. We've been told that more people are reading, more people are going to the Pure Bible Search website. Father, we thank you for that. We ask you to bless your word in their hearts. Father, while you have them home with your families, I pray, dear God, that you would speak to them, that your spirit would move in their hearts. And Father, it would take something like this to wake some people up, to shake them, maybe to put a little fear in them that things may not turn out okay, things may not be better after this. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would awaken people to righteousness, awaken them to salvation. Father, we pray for those that we have mentioned, whose names and lives we have mentioned. We pray, dear God, that you would bless them, that you would give healing to those that need healing, we pray, dear God, that you would bless those who have been laid off, those who have lost their jobs. We pray, dear God, that you would uh, fill their bellies with food, help them to pay their bills. We pray, dear God, that you would be with those, Lord, who are distant, cannot be with other people. We pray, Lord, that you would bless them with people who would come to say hi to them. We pray for Sister Bonnie in the nursing home, isolated. We pray for Brother Roy, who wants to be with his wife. He never misses a day. And I pray, dear God, that you would just, uh, Father, just give him a spirit of comfort tonight. Let him know that his wife is okay and she's going to be okay. And Father, we just pray, dear God, for our nation and people around the world. That, Father, while they are searching on the Internet, looking for answers, God, they would come by the way of some preacher who preaches the gospel and preaches the truth. And I pray, dear God, that the truth would make them free. But Father, deal with this country. Deal with people, dear God, while you have them in their homes, while you have their attention. I pray, dear God, that preachers would preach the truth. Bless your word as it goes forth from this place tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. So a couple things out of this. Number one, Timothy, and I've touched on this before. He had the Holy Scriptures, but what did he have? He had copies of the Old Testament. They were not the original manuscripts. And yet Paul referred to them, number one, as holy, meaning they were pure. Number two, Paul referred to them as scripture and said that they were inspired of God. And he was not talking about the original 
manuscripts because that's what is in the faith statement of most seminaries, most Bible colleges, most churches, most movements around this world. Uh, there was an uh, article that somebody sent me and I'm, now, I'm, now I'm angry. John MacArthur, who you ought not listen to to begin with, has come out now endorsing. He's gotten permission from the Dewey Lockman Foundation. The Dewey Lockman Foundation is the group, Dewey Lockman is the guy who instituted the New American Standard Bible, which they say is the most literal to the Greek and Hebrew, which it's not, it's a lie. Because they follow the same corrupt manuscripts from the Vatican that all of the other that the King James translators rejected. They followed the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus and the Alexandrinus and all these other obscure manuscripts that are corrupt, that disagree with each other in thousands of places. That's what it's based on. But then, and I've, and I've said this, once they have a retranslation of the Bible, don't count on that translation being unchanged. Because it's always in a state, what do they call it? a state of flux, where it's, instead of it being iron, it's Plato. They can make it whatever they want to. So what John MacArthur has endorsed from, I guess, a seminary that he's linked into, they've asked the Logman Foundation to give them a license to re-translate the New American Standard, to make changes to it. So what they're going to do is, they're going to take out every place in the Bible where it says Lord as God's name it's over 6,000 times in the Old Testament the four letters in Hebrew yod heh vah -Heh, which is pronounced Jehovah they're gonna which is translated as Lord and we know that because every time the New Testament quotes the Old Testament with the with that word in it they said Lord in Greek and Lord in English. Even Jesus did it. And it's his book. And it's his title. It's his name. So they're, what they're doing is they're making a sacred name New American Standard Bible. Which really gets me. They're going to take out and change God's name. MacArthur in his little apologetic for this even said... Even the word God is sort of a bad word because there are gods and we don't worship them. So we're going to change it all so that we worship something called Yahweh. That's not his name. His name is the Lord. That's his name. And that, again, that's verified by every place in the Greek New Testament where they are quoting from the Old Testament with the yod heh vah -Heh in it. In Greek they say Kyrios, which is Lord, and in English they say the Lord. That's his name. It was verified by the New Testament. So what they're doing is they are contradicting the established authority of the New Testament and going against it to retranslate and repronounce God's name and taking it out as Lord and just calling him Yahweh. And I'm telling you, more changes will come. They're not going to stop there. They didn't stop with the NIV. They didn't stop with all of these other translations of the Bible. They're constantly changing them and they will continue to do so. I'm glad that I go to bed at night and I pray to the same God, thinking of the same Bible, who never changes. Somebody say amen. amen. But that's what's going on. And, and this is what I've told you was, was going to happen. So there's reason 497 not to listen to John MacArthur. Turn to Isaiah 28. So the question is, some, some, some preachers will say, I believe God only inspires the original manuscripts. Some preachers, some that I know, say, 
Well, I believe that God inspired the original manuscripts, and I also believe that he preserved his word in the Greek and Hebrew by way of the Textus Receptus. Okay, and that's a step in the right direction at least. And usually it's conservative fundamental pastors who will say that. But when it comes to a translation like the King James being inspired, they don't want to go there. And I think maybe it's, I don't know, whatever the reason. Maybe God just hasn't opened their eyes. Maybe they're still puppies and they need to have their eyes open. I don't know. But when God, Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. When God came to me that day and said, Mike, this Bible is right and you know it, I believed it. I believed what God said. I surrendered. I said, that's it. Now I believe it. And what I had was faith. And that was the substance of things hoped for. And it was the evidence of things not seen. I had not seen the other. There's other evidence. I had not seen it yet. I didn't understand it yet. So when I went to say, God, I want to be able to prove this, not just to me, but to other people, how can I do it? God shows us how to do it. God shows us then that he inspired the originals, which we've covered, that he promised that he would preserve his word forever so that when the translators in 1611, 1604, 1611, sat down to translate the Bible. I believe that, they, that God had preserved his word in the Hebrew and the Greek in the form of the Textus Receptus. And that's what, and they, again, they had access. They could have used the Vaticanus, but they refused it. They said, we're not, that's the Pope's Bible. We're not touching it. They knew it wasn't trustworthy. So they stuck with the Erasmus text, which was the Textus Receptus. But then, God, how can, I, how can I say to people, I believe that a translation is inspired? Because how you say things in one language is not how you say it in another language. I'll give you, for instance, if Josiah and John comes to my room, Brother Mike, how's it going? Okay, well, they are not really asking me to give a life history of how my life has been. It's an introduction. It's a way to, we're here, we're ready to talk, okay? So I say, I'm all right, how are you guys doing? We're doing fine, okay? How do they say that in Spanish? You don't know? Que pasa? Hey, que pasa? Which means, you know what it means? What passes? So if John and Josiah were to come in my office this morning and say, what passes? I'm not sure I want to answer that. Okay, so God allows for, if it says it this way in this language, God allows for it to be said this way in this language so that these people can understand it. It's the same thing. It's just said differently. Okay, so when they say that the New American Standard is most literal to the Greek and Hebrew, that makes it almost non-understandable because there are things that Greeks said or that the Hebrews said that we don't understand what they meant. It takes an interpreter. And as Joseph said, doth not interpretations belong to God. It takes an interpreter. So, Isaiah 28. Here's what God promised would happen. In verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? God is looking for people that he can teach instead of the people who know it all, like I used to. But then God converted me to somebody who he could teach because I came to realization I didn't know anything. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts, in other words, not babes, grown-ups, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Now my grandchildren are here. I doubt seriously that they understand what I just said. 
but grown-ups do. Grown-ups look at that and say, precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here little, there little. He's doubled it twice. So it's precept upon precept, line here, line there, here a little, and there a little. And it takes both testaments to do it with. You can't do it with just one. It takes both of them. So here was God's plan. Verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this, piece, to this people. So Moses. Moses was the stammering lips. Moses represents the Old Testament, the law, the whole of it. And actually, even though this is Isaiah, Paul calls this the law in 1 Corinthians 14. Doth not, doth, doth not the law say, so he refers to Isaiah as the law. The whole Old Testament is called the law. And it was by Moses, even though Moses didn't write all of it. But it's represented by Moses, who was a stammerer. He was a hard of speech. And that was Moses' excuse for not speaking to Pharaoh. How can I, I, I'm hard of speech. How can I talk to Pharaoh? So God said, I'll send Aaron. He can speak for you. And Aaron spoke for Moses. And I believe Moses is hard of speech because Moses represents the Jews not understanding the Old Testament. You can't understand the Old Testament just by hearing Moses. So with stammering lips and another tongue. The other tongue then is what the New Testament's written in. No New Testament book was written in Hebrew originally. None of it was. All of it was written in Greek. And there is no evidence to the contrary. But the Hebrew roots people and the sacred name people say, oh, it was originally written in Hebrew and then the Greeks messed it all up and then destroyed all the Hebrew documents. No, they didn't. It's a lie. It's made up. Okay? So you know what they did? They, they took the New Testament, retranslated it back into Aramaic, and said, this is the real New Testament. This is what it was originally written in. Aramaic is like the first cousin to Hebrew. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. So with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Now turn to 1 Corinthians 14. Or look up on the screen. But I, I want you to have your Bible open or have the pure Bible search software open on your computer or whatever so you can make notes and, and, and underline these because people are going to ask you, why do you believe the King James? King James was a Mason. King James was a homosexual. That's what they're going to tell you. Okay? And it's an excuse not to believe any Bible. It's just rebellion is what it is. So 1 Corinthians 14, 21, he said, in the law it is written. And he was referring to what was written in Isaiah. The Old Testament is the law. With men, now notice how Paul says it, with men of other tongues and other lips. Did Paul get it wrong? That's not what Isaiah said, is it? Paul's speaking by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And he is now giving us the full picture of what God is saying. We have the partial picture in Isaiah 28, 11. We have the full picture together with 1 Corinthians 14, 21. The two of them must be put together so you understand fully what God is saying here. They're not contradictory. They are the part of the package. With men of other tongues and other lips... Will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that, they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Do we have an example of that? Yes. Look at verse 22. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Uh, Chuck, what's his name? Started the, um, huh? Not Chuck Missler. Huh? No. Chuck Smith started the Calvary Chapel movement, the denomination that's not a denomination, okay? Chuck Smith, I, I have the recording somewhere where he said he took this whole thing and added, he changed it. He said, I agree with J.B. Phillips where he said, 
Tongues are for a sign to them, to them that believe not, or something like that. But he added, I forgot how he did it. He, he reversed the two statements, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Chuck Smith was saying that tongues were a sign to them that believe, not to them that believe not. It's how he retranslated it. Meaning, tongues are for us in the church who believe. But that's not what it was a sign for. God said with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to this people. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So, turn to Acts chapter 2. Here's what he means. The Jews didn't believe. So tongues are for a sign to them that believe not. And it was a sign on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 to the Jews that God was transitioning from being the God of the Hebrews only to a God of all them that believe. And that's what he did at Pentecost because the Holy Ghost came down on them and did they all speak Hebrew? As far as we know, none of them did. So Acts chapter 2 verse 3, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. Cloven means parted, right? Old Testament, New Testament. Like as of fire, my word is a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with what? other tongues. What did he say back here? With men of other tongues will I speak unto this people. That's what he said in 1 Corinthians 14, 21. So there it is right there. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And that was the sign to Israel who believed not that God was going to move over from dealing purely with, he with the Jews in Hebrew to speaking in the language of hillbillies and rednecks and farmers and Gentile people. So in Acts chapter 2 verse 6, now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. That was the purpose of it, to confound Israel. Remember when Jesus said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani? What did the Jews who were standing there say? What is he saying? We don't know what he's saying. Is he calling to Elias? No, he was quoting Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Had they understood him, they would have went, wait a minute, it says they pierced my hands and feet. Wait a minute, it says that he parted, they parted my garments and cast lots for my vesture. They would have known right then that the guy on the cross was their Messiah. But they didn't understand Jesus. Stammering lips and another tongue will I speak unto this people so that they, they can hear it, but they won't know it. So, verse 7, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in other parts of Libya, about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. What did, what did they speak? In their tongues. And these disciples didn't know those languages before. That's why they were unknown. God gave them the instantaneous ability to speak his word translated into their language. And that's what that means. With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. Yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. And the Jews said, they're drunk. They're drunk. And Peter said, eh, it's about the third hour of the day. We're not drunk. Okay? 
So it was the sign to Israel that God was done with them. And he's, going to he's going to start preaching to the Gentiles now. And they're going to understand it. While the Jews, to this day, you won't catch a Jew reading the New Testament. It's an anathema to them. They won't touch it. So back at 1 Corinthians 14. Here's, here's the rules now. And when I was in Kenya... I met pastors who questioned me on this. The Holy Ghost said, Mike, don't, don't mess with them. They said that they spoke in tongues, but they did it according to 1 Corinthians 14. I was glad to hear that. Had I not heard that, I would have said, you're out of order. And God said, let everything be done decently and in order. So he said in 1 Corinthians 14, 27, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, and that by course. What, not everybody all at once, one, then another. And it could stop there. Or maybe a third one. But then let one translate. Why? But if, verse 28, but if there be no interpreter, which is a translator, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. He's not to bring that into the church. So when I went to that church here and I heard them doing that, especially the women, the Holy Ghost said, Mike, you know that's not me. And I went, yeah, I know that's not you. So he said, verse 29, let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. So again, I, I have to say to someone who would speak in a tongue that they don't know, God is not the author of confusion. That's what I have to believe. That's what I have to stick with. But of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So he gave the rules here. So, John, read to me what's up on the screen. Josiah, read to me. Let me just circle this here. So, right here. Read that to me. What? That's easy. Ho theos agape estin. Theos. That's where we get the word theology from. Ho, it's a O, but it's got a mark in front of it, so it's ho theos agape estin. Estin means is. Agape means Love. Theos means God. What do you think that says? For God is love. Isn't that neat? But you still can't read it, can you? Now, I learned the Greek letters and can read some of the words. But this is Hebrew. This is Aramaic. But that's the three unknown tongues, Josiah. So he said, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, and that by course, but they're to be translated by how many translations? So if a person says, I like to read all the translations to see what God said. Is that right? No, that's confusion because they are all, they, according to the law of America, they all have to be different significantly different. So you're not going to get what God really said out of reading all of them. You're going to get confused at what God said. God said, let one interpret. And so God follows his own rules. One Bible. One Bible in English translated for us by the gift of the Spirit. Amen. Revelation 7, 9. Now, do I believe that means that other people in other languages can have his word? I have to believe that. I have to believe that. 
Uh, Revelation 7, 9, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues. But if they don't speak Hebrew, how then could they get saved? God translated it into their tongue. Stood before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, and palms in their hands. I think the palms is significant. What did they use palm branches for in the Bible? They made booths at the Feast of Tabernacles with palm branches, specifically palm branches. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, what were they doing? They were acting out this scene right here. They were acting it out. This is a fulfillment, I believe, of prophecy. Okay? But the idea is it was from all Nations, kindreds, people, and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes. So obviously, God said, I'm going to speak to people in their language. And if God speaks it, it's pure. Amen? Amen. Isaiah 59. Turn there. Isaiah 59. See, that's what I miss out of not having all the people here. I don't hear all the pages turning. It makes me think y'all are asleep or you're daydreaming. Isaiah 59, 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord from henceforth and forever the word that God put in Isaiah's mouth he said he would preserve it forever same so if God and that was the original manuscript Isaiah what Isaiah wrote was the original if God promised that those words would be preserved he doesn't lie he never lies he preserved the word even though the originals are gone are the scriptures still holy? Daniel 10, 21. I will show thee what is, which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. So this question is, are the, are the, is the Bible still inspired, even though it's translated? Can a translation be inspired? Here's what Dallas Theological Seminary says in their doctrinal statement. We believe that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, which we understand the whole Bible is inspired in the sense, here's their catch phrase, in the sense, in this limited way, that holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit to write the very words of scripture. Sounds good so far. We believe that this divine inspiration extends equally and fully to all parts of the writings, historical, poetical, doctrinal, and prophetical, as appeared in the original manuscripts, period. We believe that the whole Bible in the originals is therefore without error. But that's where they stop. And there are no originals. So according to them, there is no real Bible doesn't exist. So, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Job 32, 8, but there is a spirit in man and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Rule number one, if it is scripture, it is inspired. Amen? What's the other rule number one? There's no mistakes in the Bible. Okay? Um, let me just run through a couple verses here and I'm going to ask these questions about what the word scripture means. Jesus saith unto them, did you never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. Question, was Jesus asking them if they had read the original manuscripts or had they read copies? What were they reading at the time of Jesus? Copies. But Jesus called it scriptures. Okay? So, Psalm 118, 22, this... This is the stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. Notice that in both versions of this verse, even though they differ, 
Are they both still inspired by God? Equally, yes. And that's, again, that's the point that I make. The Old Testament and the New Testament, even when they quote, New Testament quote the Old Testament, it doesn't quote it exactly. There's always little differences in it. But it's like seeing the same object out of two eyes. You get the full and complete picture out of both. Here's another one. Matthew 22, 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. So the question is, is Jesus telling them that they are in error because they do not know the original manuscripts? No. They are in error because they don't know what? The Scriptures, which apparently had to have been copies copies is that rain praise the lord um luke 4 turn there and i'm gonna let's see where do i want it that is that is rain i like it turn to luke chapter 4. Uh oh well at least your car's gonna be clean now luke chapter 24 verse 27 Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What was he referring to? The originals or the copies? The copies. And they drew nigh into the village whether they went. And he made, us, made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave to them. And their eyes were opened. And they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. I would love to see that. I would love for Jesus to disappear in front of me. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? Look at Luke 24 verse 44 he said unto them these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures your problem is not that you need a new translation and go listen to what John MacArthur said about what he's doing to the Bible he made all these excuses why he's going to do this like it's going to make it better and it's you're going to understand it better john macarthur doesn't make anybody understand the scriptures jesus does amen, amen. only jesus what did he do he opened the scriptures and he opened their understanding. Remember what he said in Revelation 3. I am he that shutteth and no man openeth. And he that openeth and no man shutteth. That's why I tell you, if you believe because of what I said that the King James is right, somebody else will come along and talk you out of it. But if you believe from Jesus that the Bible is right in everything that it says and that it is right now inspired, if you believe it from Jesus, if Jesus opened your understanding to that, no man can talk you out of it because no man can shut what Jesus opened. Amen! I say it louder than anybody here. Say amen real loud, Uriah. Journey. Oh, well, amen. amen! I'll take that. Uh, some, uh, I talked to a, a couple the other day. It was so sweet to talk to them. And they said, Pastor, we, we play your sermons at night as we're going to bed. And sometimes we just fall asleep listening to you. And I said, that's great because I have people that sit in church that fall asleep listening to me. So I'm used to that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. You believe the Bible? Is it still right? Amen. Scripture cannot be broken. Amen. Scripture cannot be broken. This world's broken. Scripture cannot be. Keep that in mind. Father, Jesus is the one. Thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you. That was you in my office that day, wasn't it? That was you. 
speaking to me, Mike, that Bible is right and you know it. That was you opening my understanding. That was you that just made the doodads go up and down my spine. That was you that brought tears to my eyes. Reading and understanding things in the Bible I had never seen before. That was you. It had to be you. And I thank you, Father, for letting Jesus open up our understanding of your word. He's the one that can loose the seals and open the book. And I pray, Father, that each time we read it, each time we meditate on it, each time we think Bible, that Jesus would come to us like he did on the road to Emmaus, like he did to the disciples, like he's, like he's done to our forefathers, and opened up our understanding so that we believe what you said. We don't need these other people to tell us what to believe and what not to believe. Help us to only trust your word in what to believe. Bless and honor that word in our lives, in all things. And thank you, God, that we're not out going to sports places and bars and concerts and every other place that you've got us home, you've got us reading your word. Thank you for that. We love you. And I pray, dear God, that more people would awaken to your word in this dark hour. When it gets dark, the light that shines, shines brighter than it ever has. And let our light so shine, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. We will see you Sunday morning, 1045 roughly. We'll start the service 11 o'clock central. God bless you.